The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Well, we have a significant issue that we need to intercede for before we continue. I have four sermons, and I promised Jennifer I would only give one. Are you with me on that? Uh, I felt felt peace on that. Father, we just thank you for you who began a good work in us are continuing it until the day of the Lord. So, Father, we just thank you. Seal this work by the power of the Holy Spirit and give us the freedom to accomplish those things that you desire in this service. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Uh, Today, I want to cover, I'm going to pick up from where I left off last week. We talked about survivors. Now, I'm talking unsaved people who under extremely difficult situations, they grow up in circumstances uh, that somehow they remained unscathed. And this one man made his, one of his life studies was to find out why some people in almost the most difficult, impossible situations somehow flourished in life. I know people like that. And you may too. Instead of, and, and here's, here's, uh, here's what they found. This man, after doing this study, went into school rooms and he says, it was easy for him to ask a teacher, do you know of any children that are really down and out and really, really suffering? You know, latchkey kids or whatever. And, and they should by all intents and purposes. And now the teachers all knew those people like this. Sure. Yeah, we know people that are really suffering. But he says, the ones that really should be problematic, but yet somehow they're excelling. That made them think. Then they had to slow down and evaluate their students and say, what students are living in deplorable condition, and yet they are excelling? And he studied them. And now this is in the natural. These are unsaved people who would r- learn to rise above their situation. And my question, the minute I read that little article, I said, how much more should we have in the Lord than that? The days of defeated Christians should be wiped out. There should be no such, that should be a contradiction of terms, right? If there's some secret in the world, now, you know what this guy called it? He put a name on it. You know what he called those people that excelled in spite of the hardships? He called it resilient. Resilient. I like that word. He basically said this this psychologist did a long-term study of children who survived and thrived in seemingly insurmountable odds. Now, that really got my attention right off the bat. These are unsaved kids. What, What did they do? It was discovered that not all of the at-risk children reacted to stress the same way. Two-thirds of them developed serious learning or behavior problems by the age of 10, had delinquency records, mental health problems, or teenage pregnancies by the age of 13. But the remaining third developed into competent, confident, caring young adults. They had attained academic, domestic, social success, and they were always ready to capitalize on new opportunities that arose. Wow. This is unsaved people who handled circumstances of life differently. What did they do different? This man labeled it, at the end of his study, resilient. 
which is like the ability to bounce back regardless. So what was it that set the resilient children apart from the other ones? Now, some had a little kickstart because they had some outside help. Perhaps someone took them under their wing and mentored them. Perhaps they had a strong bond with a supportive caregiver, parent, teacher, or other mentor-like figure. But another quite large set of elements was psychological, and it had to do with, and I want you to listen to this because this is something the Lord's been speaking to us very clearly. It was how they responded to their environment. How you respond to your environment. Not a good environment or bad environment. How you responded to any environment, good or bad. And from a young age, resilient children tended to meet the world on their own terms. They maintained a positive attitude. This is totally secular. But boy, the church needs a shot in the arm on this. Totally secular. You can't, no excuses. They didn't walk around with excuses. Well, you don't understand what I, how I lived. You don't understand what, what I've been through in my life. You don't, all the excuses I hear in the church. Somehow, somehow, they adopted a life, and this is the psychologist's bottom line, calling them resilient children, they developed a concept that life was 90% attitude, 10% circumstances. I know a whole lot of Christians that have that reversed, don't you? Huh? Poor me. Somebody got in the way of my gift. Some leader stood in the way from me being all that God wanted me to be. That's all nonsense. Nobody can stand in the way of what God wants. All of life is 90% attitude, 10% circumstances, and I'm still in the secular realm. We're still talking secular. Children that were raised under impossible situations somehow in their negative circumstances said, you know what, I'm going to maintain an attitude. One kid basically was so poor that the only food in the house, his mother was an alcoholic, the father was absent, and so that no one would think less of him, would take two slices of bread and pretend like it was a sandwich and take it to school and go to school and greet the other kids with a smile on his face. He didn't want sympathy. He didn't want somebody looking down on, oh, poor you. They had a bread sandwich. The only thing that was in the house was a loaf of bread, and he would take bread sandwiches, but when he walked in that door, he made you feel like a million dollars. My friend Sandy Colkin told me he had a blind grandfather that made you feel like a million dollars. Can you imagine that? I mean, he just, he just knew how to build you up and edify you. He didn't say, look at me, I'm blind. Feel sorry for me. Life is 90% attitude, 10% circumstances. And all of life allows us to choose between, now listen to this, this is, well, we're still secular, still unsaved people. They choose between being resilient and resentment. Those are opposites. Resilience and resentment are opposites. Resentment means to feel it again, to play that mental story over in your head again and again. Actually, I think it even means something like that. I forgot a long time ago, I remember reading, and uh, the breakdown of that word resentment was resente, but it's either to replay it again or uh, re-feel it again. And you know, the sad part about that, that resentment is uh, when you play it again, you end up in that resentment wanting revenge and it actually feeds, uh, Jennifer could explain this better, but she likes the science behind it, but it actually feeds the dopamine rush. When you are angry towards somebody and you have resentment in a sick kind of way, it feels good. And you can get addicted to that. We read a, we read a um, chemist who wrote an article 
on the most evil, and he put a little devil in there. And it's a secular. He put a little devil in there. The most evil drug in the world is dopamine. Dopamine is what causes you to have an addiction in any area, any area. Even if you're addicted to something you think is good in and of itself, it's still an addiction, and you can't break free from it. The real culprit is not the specific addiction. The real culprit's the dopamine. Dopamine pushes you to lust. Lust pushes you to more dopamine. And it's a cycle, and it builds strength and power. So uh, this chemist was saying, basically, that dopamine is the... This is a secular humanist chemist say dopamine is the most evil, and he put a little red devil there, most evil chemical in the world. Well, I, I would say scripturally, lust is the biggest problem. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, pride of life, which is lust. Now, all of us, all of life allows us to choose between resilient or resentment. They are exact opposites. And my dad didn't get saved. I led my dad to the Lord when he was 50 years old. But prior to that, I never saw my dad have an enemy. Somehow, in his unsaved life, he developed resilience. He didn't have an enemy in his life. Somehow he learned to let it go. Now, there's no redemption. There's no work of the cross in there. There's nothing that really benefits other than the fact that he somehow learned to let it go. People that don't know how to let something go, guess what? It's got you. You don't have it. It has you. And you are trapped. Release was one of the primary spiritual lessons that we taught when we traveled, huh, Jennifer? Because people didn't know how to let go. They knew how to strive, but they didn't know how to let go. We, we even printed out little cards to hand people because we saw them. You, you're your own worst enemy. You don't need the devil to beat you up. You beat yourself up in your control. And they said, what do you mean? And we would give them Romans 14, 4, the living Bible. And it didn't matter whether it was their job, uh, anything that was out of pr uh, order in their life. We used to say Romans 14, 4, the living Bible, especially your children. Because, see, you think ownership rather than stewardship. It's very easy to confuse the two. You don't own your children. You're stewards. Big difference. And that's what, therein lies the primary mistake. We say this, Romans 14, 4, Living Bible. They are God's servants, not yours. That ought to tug on the control. They belong to Him, not to you. Well, some mothers will want to argue with me, and I'll get in trouble on that one. No, they don't belong to you. They belong to God first. They're God's servants, not yours. They belong to Him and not to you. And God is able to tell them whether they're right or wrong. And God is able to make, me, make them do as they should. And you go, no way. If I don't tell them what's right and wrong, they'll never learn. Yeah, but you probably have told them again and again. Guess what? Eventually, God, in His infinite ways of speaking, we are a people under the government of voice. Are we not? In the Word of God, the primary? Under the government of voice, God has ways of speaking to the rebellious in ways that they may not like, but He'll take you by the easiest way you're willing to go. Hmm? You, can, you can learn by His Word. That's the best way. You can learn by correction. And then you can, you can learn the hard way. Go around the mountain until you finally get it that this isn't going anywhere. Right? <clears throat> now, if resentment is to feel it again, to play it again, to build that dopamine rush of addiction for revenge, then the reason, and God's been speaking this a lot, the reason that we cling to it, why do we cling to the, to the uh, uh, why, do we tr why do we treasure pain? I thought we basically try to get away from pain at all costs. Don't you? I always thought we try to avoid pain at all costs. But there's a kind of pain that you actually enjoy. You know why? Because it hurts your pride. Somebody hurt your pride, so you enjoy the pain of resentment. 
Mm. So we don't always avoid pain. Some of us like to live in our pain because we actually think we're punishing someone else. I don't know about you, but if I can get rid of pain in my life, I'd just soon do it. Hmm? And even a little momentary pain for eternal freedom is a good deal. Huh? Now, the reason we treasure the pain is because it hurt our pride and or the addiction. The dopamine keeps us doing it again and again and again. Resilience, though, <coughs> means elasticity, the ability to keep springing back regardless of what happened. I don't know how my dad did it, but he did it. My mother was the opposite. The minute I got saved, I worked overtime on her on forgiveness message because she had the attitude, you know, my aunt said something about me with playing with my cousins and my mom. Uh, they wouldn't talk for seven years. You know, that kind of thing over something silly. My mother goes, I will never forgive. My dad, on the other hand, he just never had an enemy. He's found a way to let it go. I'm telling you, there's something in letting it go in the, in the secular realm that's working. How much more should we learn the proper biblical way to let go? Right? If they've got something that works, how much more in in Jesus, should we have better solutions? That people should be coming to the church for the solution, not, not us going to the psychologist for solutions. But instead of reluctance to let go of wounds and offenses, they're eager to cast them off. I speak to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven. Basically, learning forgiveness from the heart, but you have to release it from the heart, not from the head. You release it from the heart, and you walk in a forgiveness lifestyle, you'd be surprised, offenses. I would say the vast majority, they say 67% of the people leave church basically because of an offense, but you know what? And that 67% of people who got offended, most of it was made up in their head. Isn't that scary? They were not discerning with the spirit of discernment, they were, uh, they were in the spirit of fear, which is the devil's territory, and you're seeing it through his eyes. Discernment is to see through Jesus' eyes. But you don't see through Jesus' eyes unless you have the heart. You have the heart of Jesus, you have the eyes of Jesus. We'll get into that a little later. But here's, here's the, the thing. I, I want that buoyancy. If secular people can find a buoyancy and an ability to b uh, bounce back regardless of the, of the kind of environment that they were raised in, despite of seemingly insurmountable odds, they somehow rose above it and became something of their lives. And the key that he uses was attitude, cultivating attitude. Well, here, here's what the Lord really, really laid on my heart these last days, and the, the real challenge is number three. There are three ways to read in the Spirit. Are you ready for this? Three ways to read in the Spirit. Number one is you'd say, read your Bible, right? Read the Word. And I'm saying, no, the proper way to read your Bible is basically encountering the living word in the scriptures. You can read for information, but I'll tell you what, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. When I read the word, I can read for overall understanding, but basically you don't understand anything till you met the author. When you meet the author, I used to stay on a scripture until I felt that I met that. I met that reality. I met the, the living word that's in the word. Then you've got something. And then if you can see that, you can consent, yield, and obey. Do you remember that from last week? Very simple. Consent, but you need to see it before you can consent to it. Consent, yield, consent. And if God shows you something, basically you could have it. You see it, but you yield to it so that God can work it through you. Consent, yield, obey. Look, if I had a word of knowledge and somebody said right now there's something, I could quench it because my mind could say, no, don't give that. You don't know for sure. Can you talk yourself out of stuff? So. Really, even the gifts of the Spirit won't operate properly if you don't consent. But if you consent, you yield. 
If you yield, where does the gifting even come from? Your spirit? It can rise up. Consent, yield, obey. Wait a minute, obey. How do I know it's not striving? Obey is grace. Grace is the personal presence of Jesus empowering you to be and to do, empowering you to obey. You can't even obey without grace. So I have to consent and be open to the revelation. I yield. When I yield, the new creation me. They that's joined to the Lord, one spirit, that new creation now can operate. And we co-labor together. It's me and Jesus. And we're going to move more and more into that in the days ahead to where you have a we conscious. This stuff about I'm sick, you've already separated yourself out from that relationship. No, sickness has attacked us. <laughs> Don't go to a psychologist with this. And tell them you're hearing voices. You'd be in trouble. But it's a we. They that are joined to the Lord are one spirit with him. All right. So I want to encounter the person. And we're doing this in our worship, or we're encouraging you to do it in our worship. I want to feed, not just read. Teach me, Holy Spirit, to drink instead of just think. Unsaved person can think and read. I want to bring it to the dimension of reality of intimacy with Jesus. So teach me, Holy Spirit. And you have an anointing if you're saved. You're born again. You have an anointing. He's more than willing to teach you. He wants to teach you from the inside. And he wants to guide you into all truth. He wants to teach you. You have to give consent, then yield, and then by the grace of God, you can obey and walk in it and it should flow as natural. I'll tell you what. Love precedes peace. Peace is the evidence that love is ruling and resting. Both. And if he's ruling and resting, then your perception is clear. You're going to see through his eyes. If you are in fear, hmm, people do that. Oh, I see so-and-so, so-and-so. Uh, 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 and then out of that fear, they, they fill in the blank with a guess. Which really, that's the, you're seeing in the devil's realm. You're seeing in the fear realm. That's the wrong kingdom. You want to see in the love realm. The eyes of Jesus, the heart of Jesus. Okay? Now, reading the Word, I want to encounter the living Word in the Scriptures. And I can remember how the Lord trained me to slow down. Jennifer still trained me to slow down. Just give one sermon. Don't give five. That's hard. It's hard on my flesh. My flesh has to sub be subdued. Right? But I would stay in the way the Lord, he, he, he discipled me as a baby Christian with Isaiah 50. I'm going to give you the tongue of a disciple, and you're going to have a word in season that you're going to be able to speak to the weary. So I saw suddenly, I love to talk. I used to preach to God all the time. And the anointing would dissipate. And I couldn't understand that. I love to talk. And the anointing would dissipate. And then I saw, oh, he wants to talk. I'm supposed to listen. He's the master. I'm the student. I get it. So I would, I would shut up. And I'd feel his presence would increase. And he'd give me a word like rivers. And then I'd go, oh, there is a river that makes glad the city of God. And the anointing starts going on. <laughs> but it had life on it. What did I do wrong? I interrupted him. And as a baby Christian, I used to do that in prayer meetings. I used to do that in everything because I had a revelation on everything. And as soon as somebody started talking, I had something to say. Never realizing, because you're, you think your motive is pure, but in reality, what you don't realize is that you felt a little life on something doesn't mean that you take over from there. Wisdom looks for the application might want you to just be still. And then when I found out I was still, and he goes, there's a river, and it had life on it, I would sit there and 
wean my mind and my tongue and my flesh from doing anything and surrender. And then he would go on and continue. And he would give me things on the river that I never knew before. But I had to get out of the way. And I confused excitement with anointing. You know how I knew my excitement wasn't the anointing? Well, the preacher would have a little, a little circle and they'd be sharing a scripture and I'd interrupt them and thinking I really had a powerful word. And then after I gave the word in here, it went thud. That was the way God taught me. Mm. That was out of time. You don't know the cadence of my spirit. You don't understand flow yet. All you are is excited. <laughs> That's good, Dennis. I love your excitement, your enthusiasm, but now we've got to put a harness on there. I want to get you to where you don't need a bit in the bridle and you don't need to feel the thud when you spoke out of turn. I want to guide you with my eye. And I learned that from my mother. <laughs> she didn't have to say a word. She had a look. Jennifer, even when Jennifer tells me no, to any bystanding person it would look like yes. Jennifer, here's Jennifer's no. To me. Ah. Oh. <laughs> That's really a no. Oh. That's more like, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> I love it. But I had to learn it from God first, right? Or you won't, you'll, you'll never have a clue from people. Now, the three ways to read in the Spirit, the first one is really how you deal with the Word. You know, what he did with me with Hebrews 12, you know, the Word of God is living, powerful, sharper than a two-edged sword, pierces the dividing between soul and spirit. And that, isn't that really what you want? You want to live in that realm where it divides between what's flesh and what's spirit. Huh? I want to know what's soulish and what's spirit. And I want to be under that lordship. I want to know the difference between the joints and the marrow and a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And I had discernment from the time I was a baby Christian. And I could discern the human spirit. And what was, what was unsettling for me at first was you pick up motive. Did you know people can say nice things and have a wrong motive? That can be confusing at first, too. I even got to the point where I didn't want to know. I didn't want to see any duplicity in people. I didn't want to see a contradiction. I didn't want to see hypocrisy. Until God really laid on my heart, no, this is so, the day is going to come when you're going to be able to speak a word in season to them that are weary based on what is coming, not just their words, but what is attached to their words and set them free. Motive, the source is preeminent. It's not your words, it's the source of those words. It's not just positive and negative words, it's the source. Now, the thing that really did it for me, when I'm looking at Hebrews 12, I wanted to be a student of the Word. I wanted to know the Word. I took everything Faith Camp had and was self-taught. There was nothing that I didn't read that they taught. And everything was the Word, the Word, the Word. And all of a sudden, God took me to verse 13 in Hebrews 4.12 and totally changed the whole thing for me. Hebrews 4.12, isn't that the Word? The Word of God is quick and powerful, sharper than the two. But then verse 13 said, And all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him. All of a sudden that word is a living word, and that's the only word I really want to know is the living word, and it won't contradict the written word, but I want to know that living word. I want to be filled with that living word from head to toe, because all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him. Prayer changed. It was, I was almost getting... Nobody did this to me. I did this to myself. But I was almost getting to making the Word the third person of the Trinity. And, and leaning toward legalism. And God basically said, you want the living Word as a person. And prayer. I never had a problem with that scripture after that. With be anxious for nothing but by prayer. That doesn't mean talking constantly. Prayer for me was being with Him in which all things in me was naked and open to the eyes of Him, the living Word. Pray, to pray constantly and to practice His presence was, was to be aware of His personhood and letting the peace of God rule. So for me, reading the Word was I wanted to meet the author. I needed to, 
needed the Holy Spirit to point to the real Jesus, and I wanted that nature. I walked for two years with every name. You've all learned the names of God. Jehovah, Nisi, Jehovah. Okay, okay. I walked for months in just one name until it felt real, until I knew my Jesus as that aspect of his character and nature. At some measure, it had to be real. And I could still remember when he taught me El Shaddai. I was struggling with the loaves and the fishes. And this sounds really crazy, but it bothered me that there was leftovers. I thought it should be precise. And they picked up leftovers. And that's when God took me to El Shaddai, the God who is more than enough. The cup that runneth over it is not wasteful. It's extravagant love. And he has more than enough. And that he's got more than enough for me. He's not wasteful. He's an extravagant lover. And that was a revelation for me to die to the precision and realize you can't run out. Love, it'll be restored. You won't run out. Did you ever worry about that? I, as a young Christian, I was afraid, if I keep giving and giving and giving, there'll be nothing left. I'll need to be refreshed. I'll tell you what, you give and you'll receive. You'll get it. You'll get refreshed. All right. So, that was the way he did how to read in the Spirit based on the Word of God. The second one is how to read what's going on inside of you. This part, really as a church, we need challenged. You really do need challenged. Because I found that by discernment, if I can read the human spirit, like when you're yielding, when you're not, when there's a wall, when it's hurt and I feel hurt. I've actually prayed for people where I started to cry and they were look like stone. And I'm feeling, when I discern, I'm picking up 10% or less of what is going on inside of you. And to run into Christian after Christian after Christian who had no idea what was going on inside of them. I'm saying, you better get out of your head and get build an intimate relationship with Jesus. There's no excuse for that. If someone can discern the 5%, 10% of what's going on in you, that other 90% to be totally unaware is totally irresponsible. And don't say, well, I'm a head person. I don't feel. You better start learning. Really. Because God made you. And you said, I'm giving myself to him fully and completely. Body, soul, and spirit. I'm a thinking, feeling, choosing being. And all three need to be under that lordship. You have no right to just suppress emotions and say, well, I'm a thinker. Unsaved people can do that. And you know, even unsaved people... I could ask an unsaved person, do you know when you're stressed and when you're relaxed? And most, I would say 99% can tell me the difference. How much more as a believer should you know, cultivate and be aware of what's going on inside of you with Jesus being God indwelt? Don't let him be confined and restricted. Let him be released and be an influence into the lives of people around you. And certainly for you, to rise up. So reading the inner life, it's basically letting the peace of God rule. Learning to let peace rule. Who's ruling when peace rules? That's lordship, not just Jesus is my savior. I've watched so many people tell me, God told me, God told me. And I feel their spirit, they're in hype. They're in striving. And they're going to try to convince me that God said. Well, I'm 70 now. And by golly, the next time somebody tells me God said and I don't witness it, I'm going to tell them I don't witness it. They can do with it what they want. Huh? The rule of thumb in the church is when somebody said God said, you just kind of back off. Why? Because we're trying to train them to stand on their own two feet and hear from God for themselves. But they also need, if you really love somebody, you'll tell them. You won't watch them walk off a cliff and go, I love them, Lord. Just leave them alone. Don't, don't say nothing. Don't want to offend them. Don't want to hurt their feelings. Right? Hey, I first now got this at 70. I had my first mature thought pattern at 40. So it takes a while. Yeah. Right? 
reading the inner life, because I really want to see a congregation that, that feeds on meat and not milk. When I started out, I was a, in my opinion, I was a, probably five years old in the Lord and I started pastoring. And basically, I had people that were in the church for years going, I don't know what you're talking about. And that was intimidating. And I was going to back off. And God said, don't you dare. They need to be asking themselves why they don't understand what you're talking about. And sure enough, I found out that within the first year and a half, 450 people got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And this was in a, in a, in a group of people of 15 to 20. It was, like, it was like a revolving door for a year and a half. God said, I'm giving you the ministry of joy. And people got filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. That's what they really needed. And that's why they didn't understand some of the things I was saying. It's not that it was complicated, but I, I had this ability to attract evangelicals. And all they knew was that there was more. They just used the word more. I don't even know if I explained it properly. They just came for more. And that's what happened. They got the prayer language and they... They, uh, and here's another thing. When they did get their prayer language, I would say, there's an anointing on that. Do you know that corroboration actually instilled in them a dual witness to help encourage them to not talk themselves out of it later? When you discern life on something, that's coming from your inner life, but you can discern life on something that is said, and you can also discern when it doesn't have any life on it at all. Life and peace needs to be cultivated in the believers. That's the second way. You've got to read the Word, the living Word, and the Word of God, and make that your own foundation. But secondly, you've got to read what's going on in you. If you don't know what's going on in you, don't give words to people. If you're frustrated, don't give me your discernment. <laughs> <laughs> Sister Sonsa's so got a Jezebel spirit. And I'm going, well, you're the one manifesting while you're saying it. Let's cast that out of you. You must have caught it. <laughs> and my favorite is all those prophetic words of what's wrong with somebody. Jeez. Whatever happened to comfort, edify, and encourage? And we were trained that even a corrective word, if it's done properly, you'd want to take them out to dinner. I'm just weary of what I've seen some of the prophetic end up sounding like. It sounded like just being a fault finder. I used to do that really good before I got saved. It was easy. I could see in that realm. I knew what was wrong with everybody. This is why we have to die to blind spots. That, that should knock our pride down. We all have blind spots. But guess what? They're blind to us, but everybody else sees them. Isn't that exciting? <laughs> Oh, God, have mercy on me because everybody else can see it. I can't. And it's usually pride because pride can't see itself. It takes God the light to shine. All right? So how many, how many have we covered so far? Two. You read the Word, but you want the living Word. Secondly, you better know what's going on inside of you. What has life and peace on it? Learn that you are God and dwelt. Become more God inside minded. Not up here. Minded. God inside aware. Aware is a good word because there's people listening for words all the time when in reality you should be like at times that Jennifer and I would drive up to New England. We didn't talk all the way to New England. Thank God. <laughs> but we were aware of a relationship. I knew I was not alone in the car. And that awareness is sufficient for relationship. You don't have to talk constantly. Right? Spirit to spirit, breath to breath, heart to heart. That's intimacy with God. You don't have to be talking constantly, but you do need to be aware. You don't shut the person out. Hmm? By the way, people that shut people out invariably blame people. And yet you can discern they've got this capsule around them called rejection. And they walk with rejection everywhere they go. You go to talk to them, and if you give in to your flesh, you'll go, ah, I'll go talk to somebody else. Because you go the way of least resistance. 
lifeboat, that person with that wall of rejection, what did they just do? Up here. See, everybody rejects me. Most of this is fabricated in your imagination because you're in the wrong kingdom, the kingdom of fear, the kingdom of paranoia. You're, you're seeing through devil's eyes the world around you. I want to teach people to see in the spirit and see it from God's perspective because those resilient people had an attitude change, didn't they? And I want to get to that. But first I want to get to the third area. And this is the, this is the toughest one. And I want to be tough. I, this church is hard to come to because I'm going to give you tough stuff to do. Well, then again, you could just read it, write it, write it down and say, I ain't going to do that. But on the other hand, it's going to be real hard because eventually, eventually, you're going to be challenged. As how do you respond to the challenge? You're going to be resilient? You're going to bounce back from this message? Because here's three. Learn to read your environment. Oh, goodness gracious. You know what God challenged me with this one? One of my favorite verses, Colossians 1.11. That you would walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, please Him in all respects, strengthened with all power, according to His glorious might for attaining all steadfastness and patience with joy. I'm going to say that slow. Steadfastness and patience with joy with joy. Steadfastness has to do with all circumstances of life. Patience has to do with all people in life, good, bad, and ugly. With joy. Does that challenge anybody? That's responding to your environment and the Holy Spirit. Steadfast in all circumstances. Patient with all people. Do you know the kind of people that are in our life? Just look around. It's not an easy life, is it? Here's some of the challenges are right here sitting next to you. Right. How do you respond to these circumstances? Are you steadfast, immovable, responding in a, with joy? That's kingdom, righteousness, peace, and joy. The kingdom of God is a God emotional kingdom. It's a realm of His rule. And His rule is love, joy, and peace. So I'm going to respond to all people and all circumstances with joy. Is that going to require a supernatural walk? But I'll tell you what, you'll find that key that is exceedingly abundantly above resilience. You will find abundance. You'll find a supernatural realm to where you see everything like these down and outers in the world who can rise above their circumstances. How much more should this scripture become a challenge to believers? It's not in there for our amusement. It's in there for our attainment. Look, Acts 17. I believe some of the prophetic words this morning going toward these people. Listen to this. This is a word of the Lord for you, and, and specifically all of those that I had stand up. Acts 17, 26. From one man he made all people of the world, now they live all over the earth, but he decided exactly where they should live and exactly when they should live and decided exactly where they should live. If you're being obedient to God, you are exactly where you're supposed to be or you need to obey him and go exactly where he's telling you to go. There's a reason for placement. And most people are so afraid that they're missing out on life that they run hither and thither and miss it. Hmm? If they would find out, God, where do you want me to live? <laughs> you know, we're basically disoriented. If you walked into an emergency room and you told a nurse, I hit my head, and they say, where do you live? What do you do for a living? What's your name? And you can't answer that. You're in trouble. <laughs> They're going to keep you. And yet, the body of Christ str struggles with identity, of all things. My goodness. Look what Jesus went through to establish us as, behold what manner of love the Father's bestowed, that we should be called the children of God. Look at the price that He paid to demonstrate His love toward us. Okay. God's dealing in our life is meant to subdue your flesh. Uh-oh. 
That means to equip us for this life in the Spirit, even your trials and circumstances and temptations are tailor-made for you. And your question is not this belly aching, why, why? You know, Joe and Helen Weiner, why God? Okay, Joe and Helen Weiner died in the wilderness <laughs> from complaining and whining. But basically, start asking God, how do you want me to respond? Look at everything's falling apart. These kids, the down and outers are doing it somehow with what? What did we say was the key, according to the psychologist, for, for unsaved people? 90% attitude, 10% circumstances. Start saying, God, this is a mess. Everything's falling apart around me. How do you want me to respond? Not why. Why me? How do I respond? Because if you ask for wisdom, he'll give you the wisdom. He'll give you a strategy. He'll give you a plan that you'll come out smelling like a rose and people will think you planned it. I had no idea how to start my first church, but I did one step by step whatever God said and most of it didn't make sense until after the fact. I had pastors come and were trying to copy the infrastructure. And I'm going, you're copying something. I didn't even know what I was doing. I just basically developed the people that were there who wanted developed. If they didn't want developed, you leave them alone. And various ministries emerged out of that. Now, you read your environment. Your trials and your temptations are tailor-made. Temptations, obstacles, frustrations. Anybody have disappointments and disillusionments? Sometimes if you respond properly to them, God will, God will grow something beautiful out of the compost pile of your mistakes. Huh? Redemption is the name of the game and it will never change. Even when people give a corrective word, I always look for, well, where's the redemption? Where, I, I'm not impressed with a corrective word unless it has a solution. We should be a solution-oriented people. God is. Now, there's an exact place we should live. There's an act exactly where we should live, when we should live. Patient and steadfast with joy. Now, Philippians 1.9, And this I pray that your love would overflow more and more in real knowledge and all discernment. You see, the two keys when it comes to attitude was probably after I had been saved about 14 years, God took me through a six-month period where I was saying, and I had a good prayer life, but he got me, he suggested it, <laughs> ask me to teach you to pray. That's humbling right there because you thought you're doing really good. Huh? Teach me to pray. And he took me through seven revelations. But I only want to cover the one right now. This was my fourth revelation. God was basically telling me, he was making a little adjustment on negative and positive. Only speak positive, only speak. Don't speak negative, only speak positive. But he made a correction. And guess what that revelation was entitled? Attitude determines performance. And I'm going, okay. And guess what he showed me? Dennis, you're looking at positive and negative. The only true positive is the cross. The cross is the only true positive. A negative attitude toward God's self or others causes us to lose our peace and it hinders our progress. Bad attitudes distort your perception and your clarity. You, 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 fill, the, you fill the mind when you look through the eyes of fear you read into people and you get offended by stuff that's not even really there. How sad is that? That only tells me all the more we got to break from that rugged independent spirit, a false independent spirit. I see it in the church all over, especially you know, the prophetic, prophets running all over the place prophesying, ministering to people, but in reality they never planted, they don't know where they belong, they don't, know, they don't have any healthy connections. 
They're afraid to bounce an opinion off of someone else. You see, when you're a baby, you're sickly dependent, right? Mommy's got to do everything. Then you grow into being standing on your own two feet, and that's a good thing. Some never progress beyond that. So they're so proud of standing on their own two feet, just me and God, just me and God, just me and God. You get so proud of just standing on your own two feet that you never grow into maturity, which is interdependent, the ability to have things bounced off of someone else, especially your elders. And inquiring, even if you don't do what they say, you are not afraid to bounce your opinions off. Otherwise, you fall into false independence. False independence has a capacity to enter into bad revelation from God because it's not from God. They'll just say, God said, God said, God said. And you know, even I've had people even bounce it off me after they already made the decision and after they already did it. You know what that means? I was afraid to ask your opinion beforehand that you might disagree. That's, that's baby stuff. How are you ever going to grow if you never learn to bond and connect and become part of something bigger than yourself? Relational security. So God basically said, a Holy Spirit shows you where you need to allow forgiveness to flow. You know, and positive or negative, that's wonderful. Be positive, Dennis, but the true positive has the cross in it. If it doesn't have the cross in it, you can say positive things. With their lips they praise me, but their heart is far from me. Right? You could actually have a bad source on some positive words. True positive is coming from the redemptive lordship of Jesus, coming out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. How many learned that? Life and death. And most people picture words, positive words. I picture the source of those words. That's what you need to picture. Power of those words. You see, there's, there's a line, when people speak, there is a line of communication. That's the content of their words. And there's great creative power in those words, but I look for the line of by what authority are they speaking. Because that line of authority is what's going to produce, good or bad. The devil can quote scripture. So every word that proceeds out of the mouth of, of a believer, life and death are in the power of the tongue, not just the words, the power behind those words. There's a line of communication and there's a line of authority. Have you ever had people lie to you? I've had them lie to me and they had a sweet expression on their face and their words were positive. Yes, I made my bed. Yes, I did the dishes. And then you go, the dishes weren't done, the bed wasn't made. But it wasn't as sweet sounding. It had to be true, they were so sweet. Now, the two strategies to maintain that right attitude. Remember, if kids in the world could become resilient with a proper attitude, how much more would a believer walk in victory and an abundance of life? And you know what it would require? For you to be honest and pure and walk in a forgiveness lifestyle and release. Forgiveness deals with the sin and the blood with the stain, but those are not two separate processes. It's one and the same. When you forgive, it takes care of it completely. How many know it's instant? Everybody? Because here's, here's some of the things you will hear. It's a long, difficult process to forgive. There's levels of forgiveness because there's levels of different kinds of hurts, some worse than others. Forgive and live with the pain. Oh, here's my favorite. Forgive, and when God sees fit, he will take away the pain. Isn't that strange? That's like saying, stay in sin, and God in his good time will come and take away the pain. But no, no, they said, forgive, 
and God will take away the pain later. <coughs> when forgiveness is from the heart, there is cleansing, there's the remission of sin, and there's the cleansing unto righteousness. If, if you walk in the light as He is in the light, the blood continually cleanses you from all unrighteousness. The second, the second element for maintaining the proper attitude is that if forgiveness is not spontaneous and if you haven't gotten to the point where you can resist temptation and not sin in the first place, you at least, you at least learn that without the cross nothing changes that forgiveness must include the cross. And let me just add this because this is a, a sticking point with some people. I've had people come to me person after person after person for years who basically had good intentions but they missed the cross. And they would say, oh, I was hurting and you know, my father used to chain me in the basement and oh, I prayed with somebody and I saw Jesus holding me while I was in the basement. He was there and I, he was holding me and I felt so much better. Do you know what you just did? You changed the scenario to something more palatable. You did not teach them to face their pain. You did not teach them to take that pain to the cross. No, my father really did chain me in the basement. It brings up hurt in here and Jesus in me through that recreated human spirit, that spirit of, of Jesus and forgiveness. The forgiver flows through and takes away the pain while I see that he really chained me in the basement. That's the cross. No make-believe scenarios. You make a make-believe scenario and you actually give the person a false sense that something got changed because if you change the picture, rather than take it to the cross, what happens? Every thought has a corresponding emotion. So instead of bringing it to the cross, you change it to a picture that has a better emotion attached to it. And we would all like that, because why? We avoid pain at all costs. But the benefit of the cross for a changed life and an overcoming life requires you to face your pain momentarily. Say that word back to me. Momentarily so that the fruit might remain for the rest of your life. Is that a good deal? I wouldn't mind getting an injection if I knew I was going to be healthy after that. I would momentarily experience the pain for health and healing, wouldn't you? So the two keys to raising up a resilient people is to quit reading your circumstances with your carnal mind. You're not smart enough. You're in the devil's territory. You will interpret people's actions and behaviors and even their words with a twist. But if you walk in a forgiveness lifestyle and you maintain your peace, peace precedes perception. And you'll have the heart of Jesus, you'll have the eyes of Jesus. God wants you to start seeing it the way it really is. You know, it's almost like we're living in the Matrix. How many saw that movie, The Matrix? It's like we're living there. But the real kingdom is the kingdom of God. It's in that invisible realm. And God wants you to perceive things from that realm, not from the natural realm. Consent. If you see it, consent to it, yield, and obey. Right? Let's, let's pray through that. Father, right now, I want to pray that we break a spirit of tolerating blind spots in our life. I want to see, I want to see that area, God. Shine your light. Search me with the flashlight in the innermost being. Not in my mind, but search my heart. Search me for Areas that could cause me trouble in the days ahead. Show me, God. And I receive right now, right now, watch by Ustream, 
and, and, and on YouTube, there's people that are, that are observing this right now and God is saying, I'm showing you the stuff that other people see that you don't see. Are you willing? And if you're willing to see it, are you willing to face it, receive forgiveness, consent, yield, and then obey to turning that around? I humble myself before you, Lord Jesus, to see blind spots. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com. Did you know that we have an online school available? Hi, I'm Pastor Jason Clark. We invite you to join our international community of almost a thousand students currently enrolled in a school like no other. Team Embassy equips believers to live in the Spirit by giving them the how-to tools for wholeness, intimacy with God, and living the abundant life Jesus promised us. You will learn how to heal emotional pain quickly and completely. You'll discover amazing keys to tap into the fruit of the Spirit and practice the presence of God as a lifestyle. Exciting courses available include the 60-day challenge, self-deliverance, healing rejection, codependency, intimate prayer, the functions of the human spirit, and many, many more. It's formatted so that you could take it with you on all your mobile devices. Sign up today at training.teamembassy.com. Be transformed. Become all God created you to be. You will never be the same.